Hi everyone, welcome to Loving Living Local again. Today is Rare Disease Day in the world, and I'd like to welcome Kevin Alexander, Senior Editor and Videographer for CRM Studios here in Shreveport, who started his career in television news where he covered the Columbia shuttle disaster, Hurricane Trina, Katrina, among others, and his storytelling gifts extend beyond the screen to a podcast entitled Never Give Up, a rare disease podcast available on Apple. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So a rare disease is defined as fewer than 200,000 people live with it, and that is one in every 1,500 Americans. Yeah, it's not as rare as some people might think. You know, the rare disease I have is called PKU and there's maybe 20,000 people in the U.S. who have it but um, rare diseases as a whole affect about 30 million Americans. I think some of the statistics that you could come across are pretty uh, pretty interesting and you provided us with some of those. So 10,000 known rare diseases affecting 400 million people globally. Yes, those are updated statistics from last year from the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Uh, they're actually the, the people that put on Global Rare Disease Day Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these statistics I came across last year at an event in Washington, D.C., and they just really floored me. Right. So 95% uh, of all rare diseases have no approved treatments. That was a surprise. Correct. And, you know, PKU, the one I have, is one of those 5% that actually does have treatments. But this, the truth is, for many, many people, not only do they struggle for years to get a diagnosis, I think the average is maybe seven years, but in addition, even if they're, after they have a diagnosis, there's no approved treatments. So you said you're lucky in one of your podcasts. You absolutely do have a treatment that yes. you were diagnosed early, and you can you can actually get medication, which is not true for all people. Uh, also, 50% of people with rare diseases are children. Yes, yes, um, you know, and that's that that statistic. And the next one is really just really absolutely floored me that 30% of children who have a rare disease don't live to the age of five. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's also 30% of those affected. That is amazing. Yeah. And so that's why you really advocate mm -hmm. for a newborn screening. Yes, so newborn screening is the thing that most people take for granted, don't really know that exists. Maybe they remember if your child's born and shortly after birth they receive this heel prick and they take a blood sample and people always wonder, well, what is that? And many people who work in the profession, you know, in the healthcare profession are familiar with it, of course, and maybe they even refer to it as the PKU test in some cases in some places but uh, that condition that you know that test exists for people like me because without that test if PKU was not diagnosed immediately at birth I wouldn't have the life that I have I wouldn't be able to sit here and communicate with you I would have been I would have experienced uh, developmental delays from a very young age and most likely institutionalized for life right also well, for those who don't know exp explain what PKU yeah. is so PKU is an inherited metabolic disorder and it is um, there's an enzyme in the liver that cannot properly metabolize or process it, an amino acid called phenylalanine and so the treatment the standard of treatment is a low protein diet so we can't have that amino acid if it stays in our system it passes into the blood brain barrier and it can cause brain damage but in the 1950s they developed the first treatment which is called dietary therapy or the low protein diet as we commonly refer to it and that just means most people with PKU have to eat a protein restricted diet and to put that into perspective most people with PKU can average about four to eight grams of protein, maybe even as higher as 20 grams, maybe even as low as one or two grams per day. And so as a point of reference, one slice of bread has about four grams of protein. So those individuals, you have to eat a very, very restricted diet with complex foods like medical foods that are created specifically for people with PKU. Um, there's other treatments not available and so that our story has evolved over the years and so like I'm personally on a medication that allows me to eat much more protein like 50 grams of protein which is closer to an average diet but I still can't eat meat. You know, I can eat most other things now besides meat and there's other people who have an injection they take that allows them to eat unrestricted in the normal diet. But it's still, no matter where you're at in the level of protein uh, protein that you can intake, it's still a daily management, a daily routine, and it never stops. Well, and that's why early, early screening is really, really important. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk more with Kevin about the rare disease, PKU. We'll be right back. Hi guys, across the world today is Rare Disease Day and we continue our conversation with Kevin Alexander, creator of a podcast entitled Never Give Up, a rare disease podcast available 
on Apple. So I know that uh, this, it, this disease that you have been diagnosed with since birth, mm -hmm. PKU, you say early detection, uh, which is newborn screening, is vital. Absolutely. So, you know, a classic example of this is um, in the 1950s, the first person ever diagnosed and treated with PKU, early 1950s. Newborn screening didn't exist at the time, and so her mother uh, struggled for years to get a diagnosis. And by the time that she was diagnosed with PKU and put on this, and they developed this treatment, the sad truth is that the you know the effects had already been you know, had been done at that point. Fast forward to today, and now. Children with, PK, children with PKU, when they're born, are detected through newborn screening, immediately placed on treatment, and because of that one change and that one action, their lives can proceed mostly as normal. We still have challenges in our community accessing care, absolutely, but our story is different than so many others that live with a rare disease. Very, very true. And when did you get the idea to start the podcast? Uh, about, I think it was early last year. Um, I had, you know, I've been involved in PKU advocacy since 2012, when I start, first started telling my story about PKU. And I took a break for a couple of years during COVID. And when I kind of came back to the world of advocacy, I thought I really would like to do something a little bit different. You know, I've spent all of my career and even my advocacy work doing video work and telling my story visually and telling other people's stories visually. But I wanted to do something a little bit different with the podcast and do a storytelling podcast. So I don't really interview guests all the time. I do when I travel to different conferences and can interview them and weave it into a story. But most of the time, my stories, uh, the episodes are narrated stories. Right. And, uh, you really need to listen to them. They're very, very beautifully done. There's beautiful music, wonderful information. And you found through doing this podcast that not only are people interested in the information you have there uh, about PKU, people of all kinds of rare disease backgrounds are listening to the podcast as well. Correct. You know, one of the great things about social media is, um, you know, social media has its downsides, of course, but one of the great things is it has allowed people like me with rare diseases to connect with each other across the world. Because when I was growing up, I knew nobody else affected by PKU until I was in my early 30s. And that just happened to be around the time that social media became popular and common. And then now there is a very vibrant PKU community, but also rare disease community. And so every single day, every single day I'm chatting with someone on social media from all over the world whether that's PKU and those who I identify most closely with from that shared experience or now especially since producing the podcast others affected by rare diseases right and uh, you, people may remember we also did a segment with your beautiful sister Angel Alexander who was uh, diagnosed with a very form of rare cancer I think fewer than five percent of the cases of breast cancer uh, are triple negative uh, so this is something that uh, is being dealt with by many people more Correct. people than I think you realize. Correct. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting because when I when I created the podcast, it was January last year when I had the idea for it, but I didn't release it until May. And it was in between that time that Angel was diagnosed with breast cancer, a rare form of breast cancer. And so it, you know, had special meaning after that. But it's interesting yeah. because I've also connected with other people that I didn't know, people I used to go to high school with who are sharing stories now about their family members who have a rare disease. And what is it like to be able to talk to a physician uh, who comes to the forefront of this cause and you as an advocate? Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people? You know, first of all, if you know, we see specialists with PKU. So, like, I have a obviously have a doctor like everybody else. But for PKU, I travel all the way sometimes to New Orleans, where my specialist is. And for people in that world who are very, very familiar with with PKU, my first thing is thank you, because the truth is, you know, this is such a rare condition that we need more doctors who are willing to study genetics and genomics and study rare diseases, dedicate their lives to advocacy and treating us. So if you have two takeaways, what are some of the things that you would want for people to sure. know? First thing is rare diseases aren't so rare. You know, like we shared the statistics before, but you know, there's about 30 million Americans who have a rare disease, 400 million across the world who have a rare disease. Um, but, and even though many of those rare diseases don't have a treatment, one of my friends in the community says that community is a form of treatment. So we have each other to hold on to. But the main thing is my rare disease you know, the average person may never come across it, but every single person is going to encounter a newborn screening at some point. And I just think it's, even if your child is never diagnosed with a rare condition, detected through newborn screening, just being armed with that information about that process happening, you know, in the hospital is important. So right now, is it is it not compulsory that they do this screening? It is in the United States, but there's a handful of conditions, like 30 conditions that are screened. PKU just happened to be the first condition that was screened for. Um, but there's, you know, there's federal guidelines about what should be screened for, but every state does things a little bit differently. PKU 
KU happens to be the one that's on all rare diseases. But I'll mention that there's other rare diseases, one in particular I think of called Crab A disease, and I'm connected with a mother whose child died from Crab A disease because newborn screening wasn't provided at the time. Wow, well you've heard some heartwarming stories, you've heard some tragic stories, and hopefully all of the stories out there could be more heartwarming as more people learn about these diseases and how to uh, a screen for them early. So if you want to listen to it, uh, your podcast is Never Give Up, and it's uh, very specifically uh, dedicated to PKU and other rare diseases, available on Apple.